Now with a roundup of all the day's headlines is the very latest ITV News. The government says it will review very positive vaccine data with an eye to lifting lockdown. As thousands line up to get a jab, the Justice Secretary wouldn't rule out an early easing of restrictions in England. I'm not going to predict precisely what that is going to result in, but it will allow us to look at, at the emerging evidence, which, you know, with regard to the vaccine, has been very positive. Also tonight, protesters in Brazil, one of the worst hit countries by COVID, call for President Bolsonaro to go. <laughs> Wales lose to Italy, but the fans who flew to see them celebrate as they become the first home nation to go through. And a Father's Day present like no other to the stroke victim saved by a guardian angel. This is ITV News with Raggy Omar. Good evening. Tomorrow, June the 21st, was meant to be the day when all COVID restrictions in England would be lifted. But as the Delta variant surged, freedom was delayed to give the vaccination rollout a boost in the race against the virus. Today, the government raised hopes of a possible early lifting of lockdown in the face of what it called very positive vaccine data. This weekend, thousands of young people lined up for their first dose as officials revealed they were ahead of schedule for the second jabs. Here's our political Political correspondent Hannah Miller. For months they've waited for what they see as a shot at freedom. Tottenham Stadium transformed into a mass vaccination clinic for over 18s today gave away almost a week's worth of vaccines in a day. I was just like saying I'm so excited. <laughs> really I'm so excited because uh, it gives you a lot of opportunities. I just started university in this whole pandemic and that kind of ruined the whole experience so I'm looking forward to getting back to normality again. It's good. It feels like a sort of free pass for, you know, whatever ends up happening with the summer. At least it's like, you know, the first step to getting me, you know, available to do any of that stuff. 116,000 18 to 24 year olds have had their first vaccine in the last 24 hours, with the rollout ahead of its target to double jab two thirds of adults in the next four weeks. With two doses offering more than 90% protection against going to hospital with the virus, the government's now under pressure to ease restrictions before July the 19th. I think it was important that we put in that two-week uh, check, if you like, to uh, uh, tell the public how far we are going. Uh, I'm not going to predict precisely what that is going to result in, but it will allow us to look at, uh, at the emerging evidence, which, you know, with regard to the vaccine, has been very positive. One restriction that will be lifted on what had been hoped to be Freedom Day. From tomorrow, couples will be able to have more than 30 socially distanced guests at a wedding for the first time since the pandemic began. But for Chris and Chanel, it hasn't been easy. Venues and everyone are trying to come to terms with what they can and what they can't do. And for us, being one of the first weddings after the lift, it's, it's not fun. We have no clarity. For it to now be, um, yes, you can have the maximum guest capacity, which is great, but then to not be able to dance, to celebrate with family and friends, and that's a major part of the celebration of the day of the wedding. Um, so it is, it is disappointing. It was very bittersweet, the announcement on Monday, to be honest. The government's also moved to make non-religious outdoor ceremonies legal for the first time from July, a change that could last when restrictions are gone. If the vaccine rollout continues like this, ministers' confidence to look to life beyond lockdown will also receive a boost. And Hannah is here in the studio. Hannah, we've had our hopes raised and dashed a few times. What hope is there, do you think, that Freedom Day, as we call it, might be brought forward? Freedom Day Mark II, is that what we exactly. call it now? I think the chances of life going back to normal completely before July the 19th are pretty slim. Government sources telling The Telegraph tonight that we're probably not in the right place for that to happen. There are really 
three reasons for that. One, cases are still going up pretty quickly in some parts of the country. Two, the longer you leave it, the more time you have to get those second doses into arms. And three, despite the complaints from some Conservative backbenches, the political imperative isn't really there. The vast majority of the polling data suggests that the public are on board with this four-week delay. As much as it comes at a cost to some of those businesses, the government say July the 19th is the terminus date. That is the date we're on track for. OK, that's very clear. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed, Hannah. Protesters have taken to the streets across Brazil, calling for the removal of the country's president over his handling of the COVID pandemic. The number of COVID-related deaths in the country has passed half a million, the second highest death toll in the world. Those demonstrating blame Jair Bolsonaro for allowing the virus to run out of control. As experts warn, a fresh wave is just beginning. Sergio Caria reports. On Brazil's famous Copacabana beach today, 500 roses to commemorate the half a million lives lost in the country to coronavirus, the world's second deadliest outbreak. And only one man is being blamed for this devastating death toll, the president, Jair Bolsonaro. Absolutely. This man saying absolutely Bolsonaro is to blame and his rejection of measures to reduce the impact. That anger combined with grief bringing people to the streets of Brazil in their thousands, who say it's Bolsonaro who's prolonging the COVID crisis and has likely given rise to new variants of the virus. In Sao Paulo, there were chants of Bolsonaro out. Earlier, they'd held up a giant inflatable, depicting him as death. In one of the worst hit areas, Manaus, they marched with umbrellas accusing him of genocide. In Rio, they are calling for his resignation. This protester saying, we can't wait to take him out in the elections next year. We will fight him from now on in the streets and on the internet. He is a threat to democracy. That anger is accompanied by despair at Brazil's cemeteries as another loved one is laid to rest. Brazil is averaging 2,000 deaths a day. Yet just 11% of Brazilians are fully vaccinated. Bolsonaro is a vaccine skeptic and is against wearing masks and social distancing and has dismissed the virus itself as a little flu. After a year of devastating loss, this surge in Brazil is more deadly than before that this country is taking an alarming turn for the worse, potentially threatens the progress made well beyond its borders. Sejal Karia, ITV News. Some of the day's other news now, and tributes have been being paid to a six-year-old girl who died after being struck by a car last night. Charlotte Naglis was described as always smiling and full of life. She'd been walking in Stoke-on-Trent with her father, who's being treated in hospital for his injuries. McDonald's is creating 20,000 new jobs across the UK and Ireland with the opening of 50 restaurants. They say it will happen over the next 12 months. And athletes have begun descending on Tokyo ahead of next month's Olympics, but a member of the Ugandan Olympic squad has become the first arrival to test positive for COVID. That person will now have to quarantine ahead of the Games, which begins on the 23rd of July. To the Euros, where Wales have tonight become the first home nation to secure a place in the knockout stages of the competition. It was a nervy evening for the fans who made the journey to Rome and those back home. Down to 10 men for much of the game, a 1 0 defeat was enough to clinch second place in their group from Rome. Lucy Watson reports. They were a sight to behold on the streets of Rome. All smiles ahead of the big clash. The Romans lapping up the Welsh charm in a festival of colour. The roar of Wales versus the passion of Italy. Let's go, Italy! Wales knew that a win or draw here would guarantee them a place in the knockout stages and they were fired up to finish the group on a high. Italy shuffled their team, putting on plenty of fresh legs and they looked strong. It wasn't long before Italy struck. Verratti's free kick was turned into the Welsh net by Piscina. Clever, very clever! 
Aaron Ramsey, who'd scored against Turkey, had a chance to level it for Wales, but couldn't take it. Then a high challenge by Ethan Ampadu, and the Welsh defender was sent off. All right. A man down, Wales were up against it. Then they should have equalised, but Gareth tag. Bale wasted it. On. But Bale puts it over. It didn't matter. Despite losing 1-0, Switzerland's 3-1 win over Turkey meant Wales were through. Yeah, it was a lot of defending, a lot of running, very, some very tired bodies out there. So, um, no, proud of the boys, obviously. We wanted to try and get a result, but um, I guess it made no difference. We finished second anyway. So. It was a fair final score inside Stadio Olimpico tonight. As expected, the Italians dominated. But it was a real achievement for the Welsh side to hang on to 1-0 for nearly 40 minutes when they were down to just 10 men. Next stop, Amsterdam for the knockout stages. Wales, Wales, Wales. And second was good enough for the fans. Their exodus from the arena was a loud one. You'd have thought they'd won. We're through, and we're through to Amsterdam, and I'm very, very happy about that. Yeah, no worries. Wales, come on, Wales. I've got tickets for Amsterdam, so I, 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 I wanted nothing more. So they celebrated with whoever in whatever shirt they were wearing, because the journey for all of them continues. Lucy Watson, ITV News, Rome. Well done, Wales. And finally, just 24 hours after making an appeal to find the woman that he believes saved his life, a man who collapsed in a London street says he has found his guardian angel. Matthew O'Toole is back home from hospital now, 10 days after his stroke, but he says without the woman he only knew as Danny, he would not be alive today. Graham Stothard met him and his family. Thank you. Today was a Father's Day Matt nearly didn't live to see. How little for you? Ten days ago, he collapsed outside a coffee shop. He didn't know why, but a passerby did. Yeah. Danny, who he thought was a nurse, knew the signs and called an ambulance. A week later, using social media, he and his wife tracked her down. She wasn't a nurse, just in the right place at the right time. We reached out and said, uh, is this you? If it is you, I don't even know how to begin to say thank you. Please, please can we meet you to say thank you properly? and to understand how you didn't just walk on by. Matt was affected by lesser known symptoms, vomiting and sweating, symptoms they say more people should know about. I'm feeling incredibly grateful. It is Father's Day and the best gift you can have on Father's Day is to be with your family. Um, you know, I, I couldn't ask for any more. I, I'm really, I very nearly wasn't. I think you start seeing the wonder in the ordinary. You realise, you know, Father's Day doesn't, you don't need to do anything major. You just need to appreciate what you've got. Is that why you haven't done anything? Yeah. OK, I'm just checking. <laughs> In a video call this afternoon, they spoke to Danny and agreed to meet for coffee. They'll also donate to a charity of her choosing, just a small token of thanks for helping to save his life. Graham Stothard, ITV News. Great story. And that is it for tonight. The national weather is next, but from everyone on the weekend team, a very good night.